Hi everybody, I'm glad you're back for part two of this Romans commentary that we're all studying together. And I had to abruptly cut off the first lesson because it just took longer than I thought it would to get through chapter one. So we are going to pick up here in verse 20 of chapter one and continue on through chapter two and really just a, a thumbnail synopsis of this part that we're going to be talking about. As I've mentioned before, this is Paul's scholarly account of leading people into the gospel. And here early on in these two chapters, chapter one, chapter two, and actually some of chapter three, um, it's Paul is just laying the foundation to keep or make ensure that everybody is on the same footing, understanding that without God, none of us are worthy to receive eternal life. This is something we can't earn. Okay, and a lot of religious folk, especially, uh, they have this mentality that is profuse in all many types of religions that because they keep a good long list of good behavior, that that makes them, that they've merited God's acceptance of them. And God doesn't grade on a curve. You don't just say, well, I keep 90, 97, 99% of the law. You know, I might fib here and there sometimes, but you know, God, I, I, I mean, I'm going to church all the time. I'm an American. I mean, doesn't that make me a Christian? <laughs> you know, and these kind of thoughts that are based on rationality, but not based in faith. And so we're going to talk about, finish off talking about, as it's mentioned in chapter one, how the Gentile believers, which a majority of us really were, I mean are, I should say the Gentiles, you know, not the ones that are believers yet, but that's, that's the background that many of us come from, that you know, even though we have a conscience that is not something that is reliable. That's something that fluctuates based on your own measure of goodness. Because, of course, Gentiles weren't given the law like the Jewish nation was, right? The Israelites, they, those are the folks that were under the law. But, even so, Gentile folks that were never given God's law to begin with. We have our own version of the law in our own hearts. You know, we just, uh, just relatively and subjectively uh, measure what's good and what's right and wrong based on, hey, you know, what's, What's acceptable today? As they, as they call it today, I think social justice. You know, what's social? What's socially acceptable or not? You know, I mean, and that's not a good standard. That's not a standard. A standard is inflexible. It's immovable. It's always constant. And that is God's truth. You can't look to the, the ways of the world and say, oh, okay, well, this is the standard in 1970, but, you know, it changes here in 2020 or 20, you know, whatever year you want to uh, look to. You know, as you know, uh, justice just fluctuates based on what people prefer of the day, right? And that is not a standard. Standard means... It doesn't change. And so that is not wise to relatively judge your acceptance, your righteousness before God based on what you think, basically. 
So let's go ahead and, and pop in back to, and this gets really heavy. This is, uh, these, these two chapters here are heavy. <laughs> this is not a, um, I'll just tell you up front, this is eat it like a, eating your vegetables kind of teaching. You know, it's not a fireworks and balloons and oh, let's celebrate kind of message, but it, but it's essential. It's essential because if you skip this part and you go straight to the gospel, then people, many times, they don't see the need, the need for the gospel. You got to get to the end of yourself, as it says in Galatians 3, 22 and 23 with the law, you know, realize, oh my gosh, I can't be perfect. That's what God requires is perfection. And that's the end of the law. Once you realize that and put your faith and trust in Christ, that's the end of the law right there. And actually, that we're getting into there, chapter 6 of Romans. But this, you know, like I said, this is a scholarly teaching where Paul is teaching line upon line and then getting to a final conclusion. And right now, we're just laying the foundation here, just getting everybody understanding of the fact that we cannot earn our own right standing before God, period. No matter who you think, who you are, you know, if you are Sister Christian, super duper, if you're Mother Teresa or, you know, or if you're a mass murderer, I mean, usually that's a no-brainer, you know, I mean, you no, no good action going on there to earn your way, right? But especially for the folks that are striving to be good, um, this this can be a real big blind spot in their spiritual understanding. Is they are trusting in their own personal goodness for relationship with God, and that is inaccurate according to the standard of God's truth. And that's it's so wonderful that we have this understanding, that, that we have a standard, you know, that I'm not teaching just, oh, well, this is Amanda's opinion, and, you know, this is what the standard of the day is and what's acceptable today. No, this is God's truth, which is inflexible, unchangeable and absolute and completely trustworthy. So the fact that we have this, we will and have this understanding, it gives us a firm confidence before God having correct understanding. That's just the power of truth. When you have it established in your heart, it gives you a Likewise, a rock solid confidence before God. So that that is a, the big, big valuable thing of knowing these things that we will be talking about is when your understanding is gelling together and it's firming up and it's getting packed down as a good foundation, it will consequently give you really good confidence and strong faith in God. And, and that is what many Christians are looking for. They don't want to have a, a flaky faith that we don't, they don't know whether or not God heard them or not. And it really leads to frustration, you know, in your relationship with God. And nobody wants that. I mean, what a waste of time, right? Nobody wants to you know, pray and pray and pray and pray and then still not have confidence that God heard you. I mean, gosh, that is, that's being in the dumps is what that is. <laughs> we don't want that. So that's why we are breaking it all the way down. So our foundation is just 
man, it is squared up and it is not tilting to one side, but it's straight up, 90 degree angles, you know, da 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 da, you know, everything that pertains to a strong building, right? Well, that's what we're doing. We're establishing our faith and a very good foundation of truth here. And Romans is one of the best ways to do it, studying Romans. So, so let's just dig in where we left off here. We're going to go to Romans 1, verse 20. And here it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So God is here in the Word is talking about his deity. He is so kindly revealed that he alone is God just by the things that we can see in nature, even in ourselves, as, as we talked about before, right? Last time we were talking about how God has made himself manifest in us. Just the fact that we are a wonderful creation that didn't just accidentally happen, but he has revealed himself in us. He has shown us shown it to us, right? And he's made it clearly seen. So we can say that God is not at fault. You know, God didn't drop the ball and just leave us hanging in the dark. No, he has revealed himself to us, as it says here in verse 20, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And many times people quote that. Don't for, don't ever forget that. So that they are without excuse. What that's talking about is that everybody has received a witness at one time or another. God speaking to their hearts once, twice, many times, like it says in Job. You know, he is long suffering, so very patient and Many times he talks to people's hearts and tenderly, gently draws them to himself, knocking on the door of their heart, as it says in Revelation, right? So here we see right there that they have no, all of humanity, every single person has no excuse to say, well, I never knew. God never talked to me. I didn't know that. I'm an atheist. I've always been an atheist. You know, no. At one point in their life, when they were still tender hearted, you know, maybe two, three years old, you know, I mean, any time, any, any, when people have an understanding of right and wrong, that means the law has appeared to them. And, and little children that young can become saved. You know, they are at that point where their, their conscience has been pricked that, oh my gosh, I'm not doing everything that mommy and daddy said. You know, they have a, a guilty conscience. It might not be a horrendously guilty conscience, a conscience, of course, but it's a pricked conscience that is supposed to lead them to faith in God, faith in Jesus. And so everybody, as God says right here in this word, is without excuse for not having faith in Christ. And so that actually, for many of us who are believing and praying for our loved ones that haven't yet trusted in Christ, this gives us great peace of mind that God is, God is always faithful, that every single person has gotten an opportunity, a witness from God to believe on him. God will never, ever, ever, I mean, isn't that amazing for billions and billions of people throughout all this time that earth has been around. God has been faithful to witness to every person and lead them to faith in him. Isn't God just 
so spectacularly faithful. That is amazing. So let's read a little bit further here. Now this is where it gets really dire, you know. Here we are talking about people who, as it says here in verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is, ironically, it's a very enlightening verse, because it, re it reveals to us the downward spiral of people who become, uh, I will just say, frankly, spiritually retarded. You know, literally, that's what's going on here. People have become foolish in their hearts and darkened in their understanding. Feudal means vain, you know, and it starts with being of the mindset that you're not even glorifying God as God. You're holding to your ridiculous belief. I'm not saying you, whoever I'm, you know, is listening to this specifically, but in general, people who do not glorify God as God, they're on the pathway of becoming, you know, they're losing their sanity. Their understanding can become completely darkened, very ignorant, dull of understanding. I mean, just elaborate that. I mean, is there anybody out there who wants to lose their their sanity? You know, we have an problem. I think we have quite an epidemic of people losing their uh, cognitive abilities. And right here, we have a spiritual root. And one thing you want to definitely not ever just say, oh, well, God's just, eh, you know, he's one of those gods. No, he is the one and only true God, period. You know, don't slide away from that and continue to glorify him, honor him, listen to him. As, like here we're reading the word, esteem the word of God. Don't just say, oh, yeah, well, I think the Bible's full of errors. Who, how can you listen to that? That's not esteeming and glorifying God because God is the Word, as it says in John, right? And then you want to definitely guard your heart to not become bitter, but remain thankful. Be of a, a, a good spirit, a good attitude, right? That That's... Negative attitude is not a good thing. It's not a good spiritual vitamin, so to say. You know, when you are bitter, you are allowing your heart to become hardened. Just like it says right here, your heart becomes hardened, basically. And you become dull of hearing God. So that's why I say this, this one verse right here, this is a big part of where it all starts, right there your little prescription. Make sure you do not follow this downward spiral, right? In verse 22, professing to be wise, these people with foolish hearts, they became fools. And we can see a lot of that happening today, can't we? And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. So instead of worshiping God, they worshiped images, like bir made of like birds and animals and creeping things. I mean, if you th even as early as when the Israelites came out of Egypt, immediately they right there in it's Exodus thirty-two. I looked it up. They were worshiping the golden calf. I mean, in no time at all, they were worshiping a calf. They're like, ah, Moses has taken too long. Let's worship the calf. <laughs> That's very scary to see how quickly people can 
turn on God. I mean, he brought them out of Egypt, that um, land of bondage for hundreds of years, miraculously through the Red Sea. And it, in no time at all, they were worshiping an image of a calf instead of the one and true only God, right? So that's a great example right there. And today we have many religions that worship animals, right? I believe Hinduism uh, counts cows as sacred. And then we got, um, you know, as they like to say, tree huggers, you know, oh, the spirit is in everything living. I'm not saying that we don't have some kind of, Oh, I'm not going to get into science right now. We're just going to keep things simple and straightforward, spiritually speaking. God, for the record, is not in the trees. God lives and breathes in his children, those who have trusted in Christ. We are the temple. God didn't say in the word that trees are the temple of God. No, we who have trusted in Christ have had our temples cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And temples, I mean this body here, your body, if you've trusted in Christ, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's where God lives. He doesn't live in images and in creation. And that's the whole point of this section right here. It's a strong correction to not get into man-made religions and ideas and tra uh, traditions that sound so snazzy, you know? You know, like, let's, let's believe that God's in everything. No, God is not in everything. That's just, um, isn't that just that you should count that as an amazing blessing that God counts you and has cleansed you so very completely that he wants to live in you, just you. You know, not the trees, not the birds, although those things are precious creations of God, but he doesn't live in those things, right? So let's not get into deception and have our foolish hearts darkened you know, does anybody want to have their heart, their understanding darkened? This is how it happens when you exchange the glory of God for creeping things, <laughs> for, for images of corruptible man and birds and animals. That's just, it's amazing. That is not God, period. And then verse 24, therefore God... Look at that. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So as I was saying those examples earlier, those are lies to think that these things are God or God contain, you know, they contain God, right? No, those are the creation, right? So let's not exchange God for those things and, and believe in lies and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So notice here that God endured long with them to the point where they were disregarding God and pushing him away and saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you, God. You know, God didn't just hurriedly leave, but after much persist, you know, persistence, I don't want to sound like God was a nag. Of course, you know, I'm not trying to sound like that at all, but he is gently patient and consistent to con continue really quite continually impress upon people's hearts 
Seek me, you know, know me. I have good things for you. I've I've rescued you from these oppressions, these burdens that you're trying to carry all on your own. He's a good, good father. And so with a voice of love, he has been trying to draw these people to him. And yet they're like, no, no, irrationally just pushing him away and saying, no, I don't want to have that. I don't want you. And so it says right there that he gave he gave them up. You know, he had to, he was, in a sense, he was run off by them. It says in here in verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. You know, he let them have their way. That's what they wanted to pursue. And he stood in their way as much as he could. But, you know, he's a gentleman and he's, not going to go against your will. You know, you have a free will to either choose life or choose death. And so it says right here, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another Men with men, committing what is shameful, even receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is what I was talking about, how they're pushing aside God. You know, they don't even want to think about Him. God gave them over to a debased mind, you know, a wicked mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, see right there, they knew it. They knew there is judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Woo! Man, that is that is an amazing list. So when you see profuse evil like it's listed there, and by the by the way, you know a lot sometimes people say, "Oh, I don't see homosexuality in the Bible. It's not in there." Well, it's not said right there per se in that word that we know today, but it did say that in verses 26 and 27, basically, you know, that women uh, lust after women and men after men. So anyway, so the, this, all this evil is, is a result of people pursuing their own passions instead of pursuing after God not counting God as God and giving him due honor and glory, remaining thankful, right? Keeping their eyes fixed on God. That is our encouragement. So we can see the outcome for people that don't hold the knowledge of God in their hearts. Like it said right there, it's a horrible way to live. This is the outcome. These are the works of the flesh. You know, this is the outcome of, you know, actually a lot of people think God, uh, people are basically good. <laughs> no, no. And this is help. This helps us understand, right? It gives us understanding. Our minds aren't darkened when it says by faith, we have understanding. You know, when you read the word and you accept it at face value, like we're reading here, 
And it clearly says that these things happen because people do not honor God and who he is, that he is the true one and only God. Instead of just saying, eh, well, I'm going to study astrology instead. You know, that that's my God. So they're studying creation again. This time it's the stars. No, that's not God. That's just a man-made religion. So don't allow your heart to become deceived. This is a really, really, I mean, it's just a word. It's a gentle way of correction. The hard way of correction, which is not God's way. Don't ever think when you get through a bad situation, well, God did that to me. No, when bad circumstances happen, that's because we lit one, we live in a fallen world. Two, we don't always know everything. Three, we don't always listen to God. And I mean, here, here we have, we're listening to God. We're listening to his word and his word says, don't be so full of yourself. <laughs> don't lean on your own understanding, but cherish me. God is encouraging us through this word here because look at what it, the horrible outcome of trusting in your own understanding is. It's horrible, horrible. Ah. So anybody in their right mind who has a reasonable amount of humility and acknowledges the word for what it is, the word of God, will listen to this word and say, I don't want that. I'm going to, I'm going to determine to know God more and more and more because I want to, I want to live with a wonderful relationship with God through Jesus. And I want to have peace that surpasses understanding. I want to live the blessed life, not a horrendous life, right? And it shouldn't be rocket science, right? I mean, one plus one equals two, believe it or not. And here we go, right here. It's laid out plain as day, right there with the outcome of being full of yourself is. That's the end result, what we just read. Ouch. But the point being made, especially here, is that when people are left to live their lives according to their own understanding, the outcome is sin and death. It's definitely not right standing with God. That's a big point being made here in this chapter. Uh, speaking specifically with regard to Gentiles, you know, people of the world, right? So let's move a little further. Let's go to the next chapter, chapter two. So here it says, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth, or you could say the righteous standard, right? Against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? So here he is, oh, he, you know, <laughs> here the word is calling out hypocrisy, basically. Because after reading first, chapter one of Romans, there were probably many religious, pharisaical believers who were like, yeah, that's right. Those Gentiles, they're just a bunch of slime buckets. You know, they do, they're horrendous. They're evil. That's right. And they would, you know, lift up themselves based on their good behavior. They had that big head syndrome, you know, thinking that they were better than the Gentiles. And he's, he I keep saying he, but I mean, you know, it is God speaking to us. He's turned the tables around and he's saying, well, don't judge them. You're doing the same thing. And that would have been a big 
splash of cold water in a lot of people's faces because they thought, well, you know, I do 99.9% .9 of things right. I'm, I'm good. They were judging themselves by themselves according to each other, like I was saying earlier. You know, looking, looking at their neighbor and saying, well, I'm better than he is, so I guess I'm okay with God. And that is not wisdom, as we can see here. Let me show you. And here I'm in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. This is the Passion Translation. It says, of course, we wouldn't dare to put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves so highly. They compare themselves to one another and make up their own standards to measure themselves by. And then they judge themselves by their own standards. What self-delusion. And that's exactly what I just said a, a little while ago, right? That when you try and judge yourself by somebody else and you're measuring your own spiritualism by somebody else and you say, well, I'm better than they are. Well, you're deluded. That's what it says right there. You're making yourself dull, spiritually dull. And whereas people think they're getting spiritually smart by doing that, but they're not. When you are sharp as a tack in the spirit, what your measurement system is, is the word. That's it. It's uncomplicated. You know, and your, your reasoning and your social justice and, you know, whatever your means of understanding, if it's not that simplistic, then you're on a road to delusion. Right? Don't want to... What the... Ta one tactic that the enemy likes to do is he'll give you, you know, 99% truth. And then he'll put in a little sneaky lie in there. And overall, it looks pretty good. But you don't want to take any hook, line, and sinker of any lie. Even if it is in a pretty good looking package. Because any lie that you, you believe in, well, then you just got in bondage to something. You don't want to believe in any lies. Because that, as Jesus put it, makes the word of God of no effect. And I'm sure many Christians out there, of course, don't want to live a defeated life with God, right? You want the word of God to work not be thwarted, right? <laughs> so that's kind of getting on my soapbox, you know? <laughs> Let's go back to Romans 2. I really like this. I just want to read this again in the New Century version. It says, if you think, this is verse 1, if you think you can judge others, you are wrong. When you judge them, you're really judging yourself guilty. Because you do the same things they do. So again, we don't want to judge others uh, according to ourselves or our, judge ourselves according to others. You know, our standard is not others. It's the word, right? Now, I want to mention just for the record here, while we're talking about judging, and that, that is a big thing in the Christendom so let's split hairs here just for the record. We aren't judging, as it's encouraged here, others, you know, but we are called to judge the spirits, to judge doctrine, right? Let me show you here, just for the record. So here in 1 John 4, verse 1, this is still New Century version. It says, My dear friends, Many false prophets have gone out into the world, so do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. So we are called to make judgments 
of what's true or what's evil or what's false, of course. But we don't judge the person, but we judge the sin or whatever wrong belief system they they or us may be believing. You know, everything should be exposed by the light, right? But we don't, uh, you know, put people under, throw people under the bus, so to say, and make, you know, make judgments of them, right? So let's, going back to verse 4, that's where we left off in Romans 2. And here is a gospel nugget, finally, right? Because <laughs> until this point, it's been kind of dire and, you know, ugh, groaning, you know? Here in verse 4, it says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Or I, I like how it says here also in the New Living Translation, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? So this is a glimpse of how God relates to us under the new covenant. It's by goodness. It's by his love and for forgiveness. You know, he, he's not out there looking for somebody to beat over the head with his bat strike throw down strikes of lightning bolts right and and cause distra- destruction and chaos no that's that's the old type of mentality that people have of god but that's not his true character as jesus revealed to us right jesus perfectly as it says in hebrews perfectly represented god the father Did we ever see him, you know, just treat people horribly, unfairly, without kindness and and amazing patience and forgiveness? No, Jesus was very, very kind and forgiving, even to the horrible snakes and vipers of the Pharisees, right? Right? And we, of course, we know the famous story. I'm not going to digress and talk about the one instance that people think of when you say something like that. And they said, well, didn't Jesus flip the tables and get really angry? Well, yeah, he got angry at the merchants that were trying to make a buck off the people and thereby keep them from the presence of God. So when you see it from that view, Jesus came to open the way for everyone to have a wonderful relationship with God freely by his work on the cross. And when Jesus saw all those merchants just blocking the way to a relationship with God, you know, blocking the doors to the temple, basically, you know, it was very symbolic. He was just infuriated that that people were, his sheep, were not getting an opportunity to come on in and enjoy the presence of God in the temple freely. You know? So anyway, that's that little nugget right there. But generally speaking, and I'm not talking about certain circumstances, but generally Jesus was always kind and forgiving, and it led multitudes of people to a relationship with the Father. His goodness led people to repentance. That is the truth of the gospel. Well, that is not the gospel per se, but that is the flavor of the gospel. It's of goodness. And it leads people to repenting, to trusting in God. What repentance, all that means in Greek, 
literally means change of mind, change your thoughts, your belief system. That's what that means. So when they saw the goodness of God, it's multitudes of people were chasing Jesus. <laughs> they were chasing him down in the streets. And that is how you lead people to a relationship with the Father, is you reveal his goodness to the people. So that's where we're going. That's ultimately where we're going. You know, Romans gets better and better and better. But right now we're doing the unglamorous uh, work of a good foundation, you know, just laying some boring bricks down there at the bottom, making sure it's flat and level. And, <laughs> and basically, we're making sure everybody knows that without Jesus, you're a sinner. That's it. That's the point I'm getting to eventually, you know. <laughs> but right here, um, the word is breaking down these religious folks who think that they have it all together and because they are the people of God, or I should say God, I can't even say it right anyway, uh, that they merit God's approval because, you know, they're children of Abraham, you know, or fill in the blank, whatever your religious identity is. I'm not saying you specifically, but... You know, lots of people say, well, I'm Catholic, so that makes me right with God, or I'm a Methodist, or I'm a fill-in-the-blank. And they think, hey, that makes me a Christian, and I'm A-OK -okay with God. Uh, no. <laughs> Just because you go into a garage, that doesn't make you a car, does it? Of course not. Well, just because you go to church... Or you got a cute little membership card that says you're of the association of fill in the blank. That doesn't make you a Christian. Simply put, a Christian, it, and it doesn't even have to do with your good works, of course. Because that's what Jesus came to set us free from. You know, a, a burdensome obligation to always have all your righteous behavior, all tidied up, all in order. No, he came to set us free from that obligation to give us eternal life freely through faith in him. So if you believe in Jesus Christ for your, your righteousness that he gives to you freely as a gift through his work on the cross, not yours, that makes you a Christian right there. Going, going to a place, going to the brick building down on the corner, that doesn't make you a Christian, right? Okay, so let's go back to Romans. So here in the New Living Translation, in verse 5, it says, But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are stirring, storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. He will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good, seeking after the glory and honor and immortality that God offers. But he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves, who refuse to obey the truth and live lives of wickedness instead. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good for the Jew first and also for the Gentile, for God shows no favoritism. So again, we are on equal platform, both Jew and Gentile. God shows no favoritism. And obviously, that's a stern warning. If, if people hadn't been convinced yet by the word that's been shared, then hearing all this about the future day of judgment, that God pours out his wrath, um, you know, that's the day when Jesus returns. This should be a big wake-up call right here, right? 
when the Gentile in verse 12, when the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. And this is a loose translation, New Living Translation, of course. So I want to emphasize and explain this verse 13 that just picking out parts of the law, of course, doesn't make you right with God. It's obeying all the law. Big, big point. And we can see that here in James 2, verse 10. And this is New Living Translation still. It says, For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, You must not commit adultery, has also said, You must not murder. So if you murder someone, but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So you got to keep it all. And the point is, is not anybody, nobody (laughs) can keep all the law perfectly. That's the point being made. You know, they were falling far short of the glory of God. The word is revealing here that the Jews have fallen completely short of the glory of God by their own failure to keep all the law. And because of their self-righteousness, as it says, let's go back here to verse, well, let's go to Romans 2 again. Hold on. So here in verse 17, I'm going to scoot down here to verse 17 for the sake of time. It says, you who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants. You know what is right because you have been taught his law. And here in verse 21, well then, if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? So on and on and on. Here in verse 24, it says, No wonder the scriptures say, The Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. So he is pointing out basically their hypocrisy. You know, they're teaching the law and being a guide to the unlearned. But the point being made is, Well, you teach this. How come you don't obey it? You know, so... The point is, is if you're going to teach it, you should be obeying it or you're a hypocrite. And that's why the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. Because, not saying you, but, you know, whenever you got a religious person that's preaching the love of Jesus, but they're mean as a snake, well, that's when you get the unbelievers saying, oh, those bunch of hypocrites, I don't want to have anything to do with them or God. That's what that's talking about right there. So hypocrisy is, it's a terrible thing. It's very deceptive. It makes people think they're in the right and following the straight and narrow, but they're off in a ditch somewhere and they don't even realize it. So it's a big, you know, that's, that is actually one of the times when Jesus would be really firm and very outspoken was with the religious hypocrites of the day to wake them up not to be rude but many times when folks are at that position in their spiritual life their hearts have become very hardened very deceived and it takes a big wake-up call for them to be jarred awake and realize their error that you are not righteous just because of your genealogy. Just because you're a Jew doesn't make you the, you know, the super duper of the day. 
And that was that's the point of this word right here is to bring people to their senses that hey, even you super duper Jews, you need Jesus too. <laughs> that's that's it in layman's terms. <laughs> that's that's Amanda's version. So let's read a little further here. I'm back here on New King James Version. This is, I'm going to scoot on down here to verse 28. And it's kind of a summarization of what a true Jew is in the light of the New Testament. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So we're not seeking praise from men for all our good behavior, all our super duper righteousness and spirituality. No, our praise that we are seeking is from God, period. You know, we don't lean on the arm of the flesh or look for men's approval, but we are seeking approval from God only, and that's through faith in Jesus. And isn't that interesting that if you are a believer in Christ, you are a true Jew. But many people probably don't realize that. But that's... Um, some people like to, uh, be more specific and they say, well, I'm a Messianic Jew. But the point, as it says here scripturally, is that when you believe in Jesus, your insides, your heart in the spirit has been circumcised inwardly. Whereas the Jews, the, the nation of the Jews, they looked for the outward appearance, the physical circumcision to prove that they were of God, you know, but God does not look at the flesh. He looks at the heart. He looks inwardly. It's not something that we boast of and say, you know, look at my heart. You can't even show your heart, right? I mean, that's of course, you can reveal the condition of your heart through your actions and your words, but it's not something you can just say, hey, look at my heart. You know, no, it's it's an inside work of the Holy Spirit, supernatural, a spiritual work that you can't do by the arm of your flesh. So when you think you're of God because of your genealogy or because you're of the nation of Israel or you know, a descendant of Abraham physically, that's not what a true Jew is, just as it says right there. Let me read that also in the today's English version. It says here in verse 28, After all, who is a real Jew truly circumcised? Is it not the man who is a Jew on the... It is not the man who is a Jew on the outside, whose circumcision is a physical thing. Rather, the real Jew is a person who is a Jew on the inside, that is, whose heart has been circumcised, and this is the work of God's Spirit, not of the written law. Such a person receives praise from God, not from human beings. So, that is what a new creation is all about. Is you have your, your heart circumcised by the Spirit when you trust in Jesus. You've become a new creation and the old has passed away. That fleshly nature, see the symbolism? You know, all the um, types and shadows of the Old Testament are pointing to the reality that we have in the new covenant. So as the in the old covenant they cut off the flesh. You know that outward circumcision. That's that is a shadow of the reality that we have 
as new creations in Christ where the old fleshly nature has been cut off and done away by the Spirit because we are joined with Christ. And when he died, he took away that old fleshly nature. It was crucified with Christ. And now you have a new God kind of nature, a spiritual nature. You are truly circumcised in inwardly. You are a true Jew. Praise God. And actually, this little point here, big, really big point, here is very helpful when you're understanding end times doctrine too. Hint, hint, hint. You know, I mean, we are true Jews. And the the way confusion happens with doctrine is you start to uh, isolate certain groups and say, oh, well, these these are the people before tribulation and those are the Jews but we aren't Jews and da 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 da, da. I mean it's just co complications that are not scriptural not necessary we are the true Jews who believe in Jesus simply put and that helps with end times doctrine by the way so we actually managed to cover chapter two. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's a miracle. So we will continue next time on chapter three. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, want to pray, and be happy to talk with you. You all have a blessed week and see you next time. Bye-bye.